he with the king of glory shall reign eternally. And that introduces our theme tonight of kingship. I've never tried to teach this, but I just wanted to learn about it. And the best way to learn is to teach. So I thought, well, let's see how this unfolds. The king of the church, the leader of the church, is Jesus. And I thought about order of service. We're so wonderfully free here to do it anyway. I grew up with the Book of Common Prayer, always the same order. And I heard a very revealing talk by a man who said, the angel of some of your churches must be very bored. The order of service hasn't changed since 1662. The angel of the church. So you think, well, what was the order before then? What was the order of service in Bible times? David Pawson was inspired by Nehemiah chapter 8, where about 12 I can say Pharisees, teachers of the law, scribes, read the law. They took it in turns to read, and they explained what it said to make sure the people could understand. And David Paulson said that's how they began their meeting, standing out in the rain. And when they had finished reading, they worshipped and praised God. So he said he'd have the Bible reading at the beginning of the meeting. And he told me that's how he ran his meetings at Gold Hill. He'd begin with the Bible reading that would inspire the songs and the prayers that came afterwards. He left and they've gone back to the standard Baptist procedure of opening prayer and songs and a sermon. I don't know if that matters or not, but I came out of my first house group thinking, well, where did this order come from? What's in the Bible? And I was very impressed by 1 Corinthians 14, 26. When you meet, each of you has a song, a word of instruction, a scripture, a tongue, a prophecy. Each of you has something to contribute. And that's played on my mind ever since. Now, two weeks ago, I was on a Monday morning Bible study with a man from Chapels of Peter called Andrew Roach. And Andrew said he just moved from the church at, at Chapel of St. Peter to a church at Ealing, another Anglican church. And they had a sermon on the word dialogos. You don't want a monologue, you want a dialogue. Dialogos is in the Bible. That's two-way. <clears throat> and it's, it occurs in Acts 19.09, where Paul led dialogues, discussions, daily, for two years at Ephesus. And the church spread all over Asia Minor before any of them completed their three-year degree course with Paul. Why do we have three-year degree courses? It took two years to get the message all over Asia. Ah, well, that's very interesting because that takes you back to about AD 41. They hadn't got the New Testament. The New Testament church had no New Testament, and that intrigues me. So they could prove from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Paul amazed everybody, as did Apollos, proving Jesus was the Messiah. Maybe everyone should take it in turns next week, the week after. Prove to us from the Old Testament Jesus is the Messiah. We'd learn our Bibles preparing that, wouldn't we? Daniel 2, where there's that dream the king has. He won't tell them what the dream is. And if they can't interpret it, they're going to be killed. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and poses them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning, etc. He sets up kings and deposes them. Okay, we'll just leave that there without adding or taking away and move on. I'll come back to that in the talk about kings. I wonder what you thought of the coronation. I'm sure it produced many thoughts in many people's mind. The pastor at Rickmansworth Baptist Church that I've been attending on a Sunday morning wears a t-shirt, Jesus is my king. And his manse is at one end of the high street and the church is the other end. And he walks down the high street, Jesus is my king, to see what happens. And a lady stopped him and said, my king is King Charles III. 
What do you say to that? He didn't have an answer. I can't save you. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Martin. Anyway, King Charles III was the oldest man yet crowned King of England. In contrast, who was the youngest? Yes, King Edward VI. He reigned from 1547, when Henry VIII died, to 1553. There's a book called The British Josiah. Has anyone heard of it? You have, British Josiah. The title of a book by N.A. Wychuk. I think he was a Pole who has become anglicised. On October the 12th, 1537, Jane Seymour, the third wife of Henry, gave birth to Edward. She died 12 days later, which is one of the saddest bits of his life. Edward was raised by some special women and men who Henry chose, trying to do right. One of them was John Hooper. I think he became Bishop of Tewkesbury. He wrote a moving tribute to the boy, which I had and I've lost. He fled when Bloody Mary came to the throne in 1553, but he felt called to come back in 1555, and he got burned for coming back, because he was a Protestant. The coronation of you know, King Edward VI was on February the 28th, 1547, when he was nine and a bit years old. In Westminster Abbey, I remember this when I saw King Charles being crowned. In those days, 1547, three swords preceded the procession down Westminster Abbey. The boy behind and the nobles behind him. So three people carried three swords. We had a great big sword there, didn't we? Carried by that lady MP. The young boy Edward, age nine, who had been so well brought up, turned to the nobles behind and said, there is one wanting. The nobles asked what it was. And the boy replied, the Bible. That book is the sword of the spirit and to be preferred before these steel swords. That ought in all right to govern us who use them, the steel swords, for the people's safety and by God's appointment. The boy of nine, without that sword, we are nothing. We can do nothing, we have not power. He that rules without it is not to be called God's minister or king. I think those are astounding words, true or false from that history book. I think it's fascinating that King Edward VI could say that. And of course he, and the people around him steered us towards being Bible-believing people, obviously because of the printing press bringing the Bible out in those days. God's word for the king is in Deuteronomy chapter 17. I wonder how well you know it. I sent a verse from here to Prince Charles when he was Prince Charles in 1996 or 7, and I received a reply. I was thinking I'd just had the privilege of having two years in a really good house group, which read the Bible through, meeting once a week, in two years. I did it very, very badly, but it still changed my life. I wasn't attending any church for 20 years. I got to this house group. I was working abroad. I came back to England and I thought, well, Lord, where do you want me now? And I've been, you know, praying that ever since, as you all have. Walking with God is a step at a time. There's a lovely scripture in Galatians, keeping in step with the Spirit. It's constant. It's not a question of arriving. It's constantly seeking God's will for the next step. So, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 onwards, Moses wrote, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and you have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers, 
Do not place a foreigner over you. Who we got now? Never mind. One who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his brothers, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Note verse 18. He is to write for himself a copy of the law. In the Septuagint, Greek translation, this phrase was translated as deuteronomos, that is, a second law. But it is considered, according to the Jewish Bible, Martin, a poor translation. It should say, uh, that's how the word Deuteronomy entered the English translation. It is not a second law. There is only one law, or Torah, or teaching. And that book, Deuteronomy, begins with, these be the words, or the words, which God gave Moses when they were about to enter the Promised Land. So the Hebrew, Hebrew Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is known as the Word. The NIV begins, these are the words of Moses. This prophecy of Deuteronomy 17 was fulfilled so accurately, it's fascinating. When the Israelites asked Samuel for a king, Samuel protested. He knew the Torah, and it all came true, albeit in about 1095, about, according to one chronology, 356 years after Moses wrote Deuteronomy. 1 Samuel, chapter 8. Dear Samuel, what a, he's one of my favourite people. Isn't he one of yours? Samuel was so wise, so faithful. 1 Samuel, chapter 8. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. So far, so good. But, when there's a but, it's always a big shock, isn't it? But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice, which is so sad, after a father like Samuel. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. What a bad idea. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. That is saying Yahweh should be their king. That's very significant for the rest of this thought tonight. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt till this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. 
Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. And others will plough his ground and reap his harvests. And still others will make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But, again, the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like the other nations, with a king to lead us, and to go out before us and fight our battles. What a bad reason to have a king. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. And so they got King Saul. And they had King David and King Solomon. And they were not perfect. Actually, we can thank God for King David because he was so bad at his worst. And so, John, I thought of this when you spoke about the man who's been a child molester, because King David was so evil when he had his friend, brother Uriah the Hittite, killed and took his wife, and God could forgive even King, King David. If he can forgive King David, he can forgive anyone, murderer, coveting another man's wife. It was a horrible period. King David clearly lost his fear of the Lord, became familiar with him. And it's so common today. People are so familiar with Jesus. He's almighty, not almighty, some people say. He is still Jesus who will judge. So King David and King Solomon live most immoral lives. 300 concubines and 700 wives but then as they grew older, they began to have some qualms. One of them wrote Proverbs, the other one, the Psalms. It's not the score at half time that counts, it's the score at the end. And the Lord will judge because he knows their hearts. We have a king, but should we have a king at all? That piece of Samuel seems to say, God is your king, or well, he should be. But kings came in very early in the Bible. In fact, I rather like Genesis 14, when I learned going around the British Museum that there's a scroll there, which has on it, in Assyrian, from about 2300 BC, five towns listed. Do you know their names? And in the same sequences in Genesis 14, they are Sodom, Gomorrah, Admar, Zeboim, and Mila, that is Zoar, five towns, and they're written twice in Genesis 14 and on this old Assyrian scroll, suggesting they actually existed, probably in sequence on a trade route. I mentioned that because people think the Old Testament is myth or starts off as myth. And the more the archeologists uncover of facts like that, the more it points to the Bible being absolutely historically correct, which is fascinating. So in Israel, nearly all the kings were bad. King David was bad for a time. The prophets are the heroes of the Old Testament. And in our history, which is, uh, King Edward VI was probably the best for those six years. Who compares with him? He didn't bring in 21 laws that contradict the Bible. Elizabeth has done. Her advisors brought her things to sign and she signed them. So one of my prayers for King Charles is he'll have the wisdom to know what not to sign. I think if the monarch turned against the, the prime minister and advisors and said, I can't sign that, it's against the Bible, it's against my coronation oath, they've got a problem. They've got to either change those immoral laws or throw out the king. 
They might find that difficult. I'd love the king or queen to do that. We'll see. We can pray for that. But we decided not to swear allegiance to Charles, but to have him as king. We vote to have prime ministers who are Anglican or Catholic, Jew, Hindu, atheist. We find ourselves with kings and leaders of the church who we do not trust. And it's quite right not to. So what do we do? And I found an answer. Psalm 146. I thought, that goes a long way to answering my question. Let the Lord answer it, because I can't, because I'm puzzling over kings. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, or hallelujah, in the Jewish Bible. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. Listen to this. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord, the maker, creator of heaven and earth. That's the living God. The sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. And he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God is Zion for all generations. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. As for Charles, we pray for the spirit of wisdom and for a desire for to do as Moses instructed and to read your word for himself daily. I don't know about you, but I just became hungry to read it every day, having not read it for 20 years. I wasn't aware of any Holy Spirit coming into me. Looking back, I can see that was probably a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He manifests himself in you this way and that way and that way. And that's a fascinating area to contemplate in many ways. I believe we should be careful how we judge King Charles. Many have judged him because of how he was unfaithful to Diana. And Camilla is judged the same way. We don't know who's really come to repentance or not, but he did seem serious at his crowning his coronation. And Camilla seems to be doing her utmost to serve charitable causes, working hard. And I'm learning not to judge. The Lord will be the judge. Josiah led reforms, but only for about two years, in 621 BC. And then they fell away again. And in came the Babylonians to punish Israel. And of course, God always punished out of love to try and bring us to repentance. Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and Ezekiel, all the prophets were crying, repent, return to me, O Israel, but they did not. I think Charles and Camilla right now are working hard to save, to serve us. And Charles's one time private secretary was interviewed in one of those coronation programs and she said she'd worked for Margaret Thatcher and somebody else, but Charles was a harder worker than all of them. Morning till night, he'd be at his desk going through papers, and he would always say, is there anything we can do to help? Isn't that good? The gift of helps, gift of helpfulness is one of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 14. I think that taking on the crown of kingship, never mind the other stuff they gave him, an orb and a scepter, kingship is quite a thing to be handed. And I think it's really made him rock back on his heels and think, what can I do to serve? And I pray he will also be blessed in his work and be saved. If God could forgive King David for his sin, surely he can forgive King Charles if he's truly repented in his heart and the Lord sees the heart. So, Lord, we pray that you will have mercy on Charles and Camilla and may they turn to you for full redemption and receive your anointing and blessing. 
I don't know what they, what he received at the coronation. I don't know what to make of that. Yes, Zadok the priest, yes, that was an anointing in history years ago. Um, but those anointed kings of Israel didn't always do very well. So may Charles have the courage to stand against ministers when they bring ungodly laws for him to sign. Talking about the coronation service with a pastor in Beaconsfield, I said I felt the, the archbishop missed an opportunity for the second time as he conducted the Queen's funeral. Uh, not millions, millions watched it. What an opportunity for a Christian leader to speak to half the world. Listen, friends, there is a gospel message. We all have sinned, but the cross is for all of us. And it's for all of you to trust in Jesus and turn to repentance to receive salvation, because we're all going to be judged. And he didn't use the opportunity to do that. And he made a very interesting comment. He said, if you think about it, it sounded humble when Charles said he had come not to be served, but to serve. Actually, these are words of Jesus. And the rest of the verse says, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That doesn't apply to Charles, and he couldn't say that. But what an opportunity with that as Charles' opening line to preach what Jesus said about himself. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and give his life as a ransom for many. All the world, listen to this. This is the message of Christianity. We may be poor examples, but that's the message that Jesus gave. Yes, Jesus died once for all repented sin. He died for many, not all. Those who say all are preaching universalism. He died for those who believe and repent, for those who put their trust in him. We do not believe in universalism, in the salvation of everyone. Jesus makes it clear at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that narrow is the way and few find it. There is no salvation in an earthly king or a prime minister. Salvation is only by, the, by faith in the blood of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who gave himself as a ransom for us. So I close with an example. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. I was rereading Fox's Book of Martyrs. Oh, it's such a moving book, isn't it? You can dip into it anywhere. I think it's chapter two. Polycarp was arrested for not bowing to the king of the era, Caesar, and saying Caesar is Lord. He was, and he died in 155 AD. The proconsul who arrested him for not submitting to Caesar as Lord urged him, not wanting to kill him, but he had to obey the emperor or be killed himself. And the proconsul said, swear, and I will release thee. Reproach Christ, deny Christ. And Polycarp replied, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king, who hath saved me? And with that, they burned him. At least they tried to, but the flames wouldn't light and burn him, so they had to kill him with a sword, which might have been kind. Well, that song that they didn't sing at the coronation really winds this up for us. And after that, anything to share, please share it. From heaven you came, helpless babe. From Graham Kendrick, number 162 in Mission Praise. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled. Not to be served, but to serve. And give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to, live our, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Aren't they wonderful words? 